Okay. <coughs> Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you all had a wonderful lunch, and I hope it was not too heavy to put you to sleep. But, uh, but I must uh, assure you that uh, there is a very interesting panel here on the dais. And uh, the topic for the uh, panel seven is called historical relationship between Tibet and Himalayas. Uh, more specifically, focusing on three regions, specifically Sikkim, Darjeeling, and Tibet. For this, we have three speakers in line. First is Dr. Rajiv Rai, second is Abhinav Atriya, and third is uh, Sonam Chota Bhutia. Um, I'll begin with the first speaker. Uh, Rajiv Rai, Dr. Rajiv Rai, in fact, uh, he is an uh, assistant professor in the Department of Political Science. Uh, at the School of Liberal Arts, ICFAI Univers uh, University, Sikkim, Gantok. He has done his PhD from Sikkim University, focusing on suburban uh, history of Sikkim. And his uh, topic for presentation for today is uh, Convention of 1890 relating to the Sikkim and Tibet, evaluation through the in, uh, India office record in Bangladesh. Basically, he has got uh, important uh, source, uh, primary source, which has not been used until now, if I'm correct. Uh, so he's going to present. So before I make, uh, uh, I request him to come on the, uh, take the uh, mic, uh, I would like to uh, make a small announcement that uh, the, uh, the time allotted is 20 minutes, but uh, I'll have to give a reminder of at 50 minutes. And this time the reminder will not just be for the speaker, it will be for the audience to also wake them up from the uh, sleep, so it's going to be a little loud. <laughs> so, yes, uh, please, carry on. Thank you. My fellow panelists and all the research scholars present here. So I'll be talking on Convention of 1890 relating to Sikkim and Tibet. So I'll try to evaluate this convention or the event that led up to the signing of Convention of 1890 through the uh, British India uh, records in, in Bangladesh. So, uh, East India Company archives in Rampur district so was the main source of information about political, commercial uh, relation with Sikkim, Bhutan, and Tibet during the late 18th century. But after the establishment of India office in 1858, those records were maintained under India office records afterwards. So the present study entails the scenario leading up to the uh, demarcation of Sikkim-Tibet border. So before 1890, there was no official border between Sikkim and uh, Tibet. So I'll be discussing two factors that led to the demarcation of this boundary in 1890. One factor is international factor and other is a localized factor. So information from the India office record says British contact with Tibet, Bhutan and Nepal can be traced back to 18th century. But after the involvement in the great game of Eastern Himalayan states, the documentation of these states began more. So the Great Game was a strategic rivalry between British Empire and the Russian Empire for the uh, supremacy of Central Asia. And uh, British considered India as their jewel in, in the crown. And Russian Empire wanted to penetrate into India from northwestern side of India through Afghanistan and through northeastern side of India through eastern Himalayan states where Tibet and Sikkim occupies a very prominent position. So this was all about the great game. So, uh, so Afghanistan in that border, western border was a buffer state. And uh, uh, both empires tried to influence Afghanistan so that uh, they could bring Afghanistan to their fold. And the Amir in between is saying, save me from my friends. So both were looking at the interest. So when Russians were advancing by conquering caravan routes, uh, 
uh, and they were threatening to establish its control over Central Asia. So England expressed in its concern about the con continuous march of Russian Empire towards South Asia. So the enormous scale of Russian Empire and its expansionist ambitions worried British, British India. So who kept a close eyes on rivals move? So they feared that their jewel in the crown would fall into the Russian hands. So, uh, so one factor that led up to the demarcation of 189 uh, border between Sikkim and Tibet was the international factor, the great game, uh, because Russia wanted to penetrate into India through uh, Sikkim Tibet area. So it felt imperative for British India to draw a boundary line between Sikkim and Tibet to prevent the Russian infiltration or Russian influence. And another localized factor was uh, a small northern kingdom of Sikkim had economic blessing and military misfortune to be located on two most accessible natural routes between Tibet and India, that is uh, Nathula and Jelepla. So the players in the great game, England and Russia, had advantage of having only one major pass to conquer, either from that side or uh, this side. So Sikkim was a key strategic outpost in the great game, where a firm British presence was deemed essential. So, historically, Maharajas of Sikkim had loyalty to Tibet and to China, who wielded protective power over Sikkim, which was a long historic fact. So, the Maharajas' annual payment of the symbolic token gifts to Chinese emperor was the evidence of the subservient relationship to China. So, one such document highlights the unusual case of uh, gifts and letters being returned to the Sikkim Sokal by the Chinese Amman. So it proves that Sikkimese Maharaja used to pay uh, gifts or taxes to, to China. Um, but in the late 1880s, 1800s, so British assumed that in case of conflict between Sikkim and Tibet, Sikkim would be a potential ally of Tibetans. So one such conflict brewed in 1886 when Tibetans feared of Macaulay mission towards Tibet and they crossed over Sikkim's territory and they came inside uh, 12 miles inside Sikkim and they started constructing a fort in Sikkim to, uh, to repeal the mission towards uh, Tibet. So this long lengthy affair became an important event which resulted to the demarcation of border between Sikkim and Tibet. So before 1890 there was no border, border demarcation between Sikkim and Tibet. So uh, any would, anyone would enter Sikkim and so uh, like uh, and they could claim the territories of Sikkim. So, so because of this, to prevent this, so British felt that so there should be a, uh, a strict borderline demarcation between uh, Sikkim and Tibet. So one factor was the international factor, the great game, because they wanted to prevent the Russian infiltration through this side of border and another. So this uh, event became an important event which led up to the demarcation of boundary between Sikkim and Tibet. So in early 1886, Macaulay mission under leadership of Colonel Macaulay, then finance secretary to the British, uh, to the government of Bengal, was assembled at Darjeeling to open up Tibet for trade. So British wanted to have a trade relation with Tibet and Tibet was reluctant for that. Mm. So they had assembled in Darjeeling and the details of, about that mission was uh, published in British newspapers and uh, it even reached to the Chinese government. So news of the mission alarmed the Tibetans, both the Amban and the Viceroy of uh, Sichuan province. 
So under whose direction Tibet was under at that point of time? So they were against this mission. So this document from Bangladesh, it suggests that, uh, so at that point of time, Maharaja Thodup Namgyal had already gone to Sumi Valley. And the existing narrative what we have is, what it says is, after a multiple like uh, requests or orders from the British government, yeah. Maharaja uh, did not obey that and did not come to Sikkim. But this document highlights that. So it was the British government who told Maharaja to go to Sumi Valley and observe the mood of Tibetans about the mission. And this thing is not highlighted in the existing narrative, narrative of Sikkim. So another document. So from Sumi Valley, Maharaja was issuing order to be obeyed by the Sikkimese officials from Sumi Valley. So it could be under pressure or it could be uh, on the free will of Maharaja. So that, that should be understood. And he issued a, a parvana, a sort of royal decree to be followed by the Sikkimese officials to help Tibetan soldiers to construct a fort in the Sikkimese territory. And this was not obeyed by two officials of Sikkim. So they protested against these orders of Maharaja. And as a result, so Tibetans relieved the Sikkimese laborers who were employed with the Tibetan laborers. So these two men, Fodong Lama and Khangsha Devan, so are considered a bad men in the history of Sikkim. Saul Mullard so contains that uh, Fudung Lama and uh, Khangsha Devan are considered to be a bad man in the history of Sikkim. So he is uh, taking out this reference from a document and they were ac accused of silent rebellion in Sikkim against the Maharaja. So Solmunar takes this reference from a document from Sikkim Palace Archives that from a letter of Maharaja Thotup Namgyal to Deputy Commissioner in Darjeeling, A.W. Paul. So it states that, so according to Maharaja, so their intention, uh, intention of these two Sikkimese officials was that they wanted to replace Sogyal of Sikkim. And they ordered taxpayers to st stop paying taxes to Sogyal to pay the taxes to themselves instead. But I have this document from National Archives of Bangladesh that so when uh, finally British intervenes and they drive out Tibetans from the territory, so after that, Maharaja returned to Sikkim from Sumi Valley. And Maharaja explains his uh, inconvenience or his, his uh, inability to obey the orders of British government. So he explains that. So he had gone to Sumi Valley with the permission of British. So he had gone to Sumi Valley in 1885 and he returned in 1888. 88. So for this period, so he was in Sumi Valley. And according to the Treaty of Tumlong, uh, 1861, so Maharaja was not allowed to stay in Sumi Valley more than three months in a year. year. But he stayed there for three years. And he says he was told by the British government to stay there. Mm. And he further states that he was uh, a youth 
and had been deserted by his old advisors, Fudong Lama and Kanchan Devan, who refused to assemble at Chumbi Valley, so did not know how to act. So when Maharaja left to Chumbi Valley, so he put Kansa Devan as a caretaker of administration in Sikkim. He, he made Kansa Devan as a regent. And these two men were resisting the Tibetan incursion in Sikkim, even after defying Maharaja's order also. So for this reason, these two men were uh, accused of uh, having ill intentions towards the Maharaja. And because of this reason, because they were protecting the interest of Sikkimese, so uh, because in this letter it is nowhere mentioned that these two men made Sikkimese to pay taxes to themselves. So this is a uh, letter of A. W. Paul, who was Deputy Commissioner of Darjeeling at that point of time. And he wrote this letter to Edgar, who was Chief Secretary to the Government of Bengal at that point of time, after interview with Raza. And Raza nowhere mentions that about what is there in this article. So there is a contestation between the sources of Sikkim source and the British source they have. And to um, uh, reached to the conclusion that so uh, these people were bad men in the history of Sikkim. So I think it's too early to to judge them for that. We should look for other uh, justifications also. So yeah, this we have discussed. And Fondang Lama and Kangsa Devan they refused to. A visit to Sumbi Valley when they were told by Raja to come there because they feared that they might get punished because, because they defied the orders of Maharaja. Because of that, they did not go to Sumbi Valley. So, after when the uh, link to affair was resolved or the war ended, so a convention was signed under British pressure. Sheng Tai, who was Omban at that point of time, under whose direction Tibet was, joined British Indian Viceroy uh, Lansdowne in Calcutta to sign the Anglo Chinese Convention relating to Sikkim and Tibet, which obligated Chinese government to recognize the British government's protectorate over Sikkim. So, in this convention, where the issue between or the border was demarcated between Sikkim and Tibet, but Sikkim and Tibet were not party of this convention. It was decided over the heads of Sikkim and Tibet by the British Empire and China. That's why Tibet did not accept it, accept this border for long for for long time. So Sikkim was deemed essential to establish a substantial uh, British presence because of the uh, great game. So Sikkim was a key strategic outpost in region guarding the Russian and Tibet uh, Chinese influence. So this became international factor for the demarcation of boundary between the two states. So the occupation of the link, link to by Tibetan force provided the British an opportunity to revise the Treaty of 1861. And the defeat of Tibetans convinced the Chinese that if they failed to come into terms with British, they might lose their influence in Tibet. As a result, the Convention of 1890 was signed between Great Britain and China. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rajiv Rai. Thank you um, also on being on time. Uh, I don't think so any much explanation need, needed as the explanation was done wonderful by him. So we'll save as much time as possible for the Q&A. Uh, second uh, speaker we have for today, in the afternoon session, is uh, we have Abhinav Atreya. 
Uh, his topic also is very much uh, similar to the one that has been just presented. Of course, the region is a little different, or Darjeeling is included over here. Uh, basically, he's a PhD scholar from Department of Sociology and Anthropology uh, from uh, Ashoka University. And his uh, area of specialization is Himalayan studies and Indo-Nepal border, borderland. Uh, the topic that he is going to present is cartographic tension in the eastern Himalayan borderland, tracing uh, routes of connection between t uh, Tibet and Darjeeling. Uh, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, esteemed professors, uh, my fellow panelists, research uh, scholars here. Um, I am from the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology, so even though I'm in the history panel, I have significant anthropological leanings. It's an interdisciplinary attempt at combining historical discourse and ethnographic portraits. How successful the attempt is, uh, I guess I will know in a while. Um, the title of the paper is Cartographic Tensions in the Eastern Himalayan Borderlands, Tracing Roots of Connections Between Tibet and Darjeeling. So the central question that I begin the paper with is asking the question if cartography of a territory that has been historically contested, is it even possible? Can we engage with cartographical attempts by empires like the British and the Chinese to understand and contain Tibet within their political space of power without giving cartography its objective credibility that a lot of, a lot of um, Western imagination strives to? Uh, so that is the central anthropological question we are dealing with. However, uh, to limit ourselves to the historical discourse would be a form of injustice not because Tibet is still a contested region, but because the past is still visible in the present. And it is this contemporary reflection of history that could aid us in grasping the ripple effects of historical developments. So when one visits Darjeeling today, a hill town in Bengal, we see Tibet alive and thriving. We see Tibetan people, shops, food, uh, language science, Buddhist monasteries. So how is it that a region that has been essentialized as isolated like Tibet have such a strong connection with a hill town of Darjeeling? Is it just because they are part of the eastern Himalayan borderlands? Is it just because there were accidents in history of migration and trade? Or could there be a broader question of knowledge production about Tibet itself? And that is why I'm looking at cartographic practices, that is methods of mapping and associated knowledge production, utilized by the British Empire and the Chinese nation state to know and contain Tibet within the influence of its political power, and look at the tensions that these cartographic practices generated and how counterproductively they intensified the already existing roots of connection between the region of Tibet and Darjeeling. Now, what I call Tibet in this paper is not just the political frontiers of Tibet, because if, I want, uh, be, because if we want to uh, have an anthropological locus, we need to figure out the ethnographic Tibet, the ethnographic field of Tibet. And so I'm drawing upon Hugh Richardson and P. Addy's work to locate how uh, we must not limit our ourselves to political frontiers. Because if historical consensus about Spiti having Tibetan chiefs, Sikkim being established by Tip uh, Tibetan immigrants, and etymological origins of Darjeeling, uh, the word Darjeeling lying in the Tibetan word Dorje is found to be accurate, then Tibetan influence in regions of Western China, Lahul, Spiti, Nepal, Sikkim, Darjeeling have to be taken into consideration. And that is the foundation for the ethnographic uh, Tibet that for this particular paper. Now, before we head to cartographic practices, we need to understand that these practices were not deployed in a space of vacuum. The imagination of Himalayas as isolated and marginal has long been negated by now. So the space of Eastern Himalayan borderlands was dynamic. Dynamic relationship of trade, migration, kinship, and interwoven histories. If one traces Tibet's ties with Darjeeling, we observe examples of significant connectivity. As I said, the etymological origins of Darjeeling being traced to Dorje, migration of the Tibetan origin Bhutia community to uh, Darjeeling from the 6th century, coronation of the king of Sikkim, which used to include Darjeeling till 1835 by uh, two Tibetan lamas, trade of wool, salt, medicinal herbs, etc. These examples reflect the deep historical ties between Tibet and Darjeeling, which allowed for an intentional or unintentional subversion of the vision of territorialization and confinement that guided the cartographic attempts of British India, British Empire, and China. Now, this dynamism has been comprehended through multiple anthropological and historical frameworks. We look at Zomia by Van Shandel and James Scott. We look at ethnic cross-border ties by Sarah Schneiderman, movement of material culture, etc. But there are also there have also been other uh, significant attempts. I will talk about uh, 
two a little bit. Uh, one is the understanding of global and local encounters, um, spoken about by Tina Harris and Chaita Sharma, who trace the development uh, of Himalaya, uh, the Himalayan town of Darjeeling, as a significant site for the British Empire that provided refuge for uh, European bodies from the tropical heat, and also allowed eventually for tea production. Uh, and Tibetans were middlemen for the trade to North, uh, North American European markets. Um, and this kind of establishment of Darjeeling as a colonial site eventually also allowed Britishers to create Darjeeling as a proxy Tibet, a site of knowledge production around Tibet. The second uh, is the understanding of places in knots by Martin Saxer. Um, this is more in a comprehension of how uh, individuals in borderlands and spaces relate to that sort of connectivity. Though situated in Nepal, this text reveals how migrant communities, despite spending most or all of their lives outside, they have a strong sense of space and belonging to their roots. And uh, for example, the migrant community, communities like that of Tibetans coming from a specific space, uh, uh, despite being dislocated from Tibet and having settled in countries like India, still feel a belonging in Tibet. And their identity and culture are even, to, even today deeply Tibetan. Now combining all of these frameworks and borrowing from James Clifford, uh, I propose the framework of roots of connection. Uh, the James Clifford's analysis of roots and traveling cultures as a counter argument to uh, territorialized notions of natives. Uh, this framework attempts to broaden the discourse by analyzing how regions come to be deeply connected, recognizing the effects of the past and the contemporary. Now moving on, uh, uh, now that I've established the framework of roots of connection, now we move on to the cartographic practices that I would like to talk about. The cartography is the science of map making and maps, and as we often assume, maps depict reality objectively, but maps are value coded, they are imposition of an ideological interest on a particular space. So thus the question is not what the maps depict, but who made the maps and sanctioned their production. Often they have been the tools of imperialist designs, from the Romans using it for decolonization, uh, for colonization, sorry, to the Italians <laughs> using it for, uh, for to support public projects in the quest of desire for control. Cartography is also intricately, intricately linked to the modernist project of the nation state. S. Krishna's conceptualization of cartographic anxiety captures the sense of unease a nation state faces when it becomes aware of the misalignment between its vision of concrete boundaries and territoriality and the socio-cultural reality of transnational ties. For Krishna, this anxiety is a characteristic of the Indian state and has resulted in practices meant to produce nationality and a sovereign identity while hiding the violence such production high, uh, generates. To say, of course, all forms of cartography is imperialistic or a re uh, reaction to state's anxiety would be a little unfair because, for example, if the British maps of Tibet were made for a foreign audience, Tibetan indigenous cartography uh, cannot be called imperialist. Uh, at the same time, if cartography as a tool of imperialism has existed throughout, why would cartographic anxiety just be a feature of the modern nation state? So I'm attempting to dislo dislocate cartographic anxiety as a concept from the framing of a modern nation state and look at historical developments. And thus I propose cartographic tensions, which for me appears to be a more apt framework to look at the practices of map making as an assertion of power and dominance. And it involves looking at the context in which they were deployed, the resulted tensions it generated, and what forms of alternate or resistant cartographies it led to. Now, going back to the indigenous Tibetan cartography, it is often classified as a form of religious cartography, blurring lines between the sacred and the geographical. And that is why transporting these depictions onto the Western imagination of Cart Cartesian map was very difficult because for the Western gaze, unusual scales, multiple orientations, buildings facing the viewer, etc., became very difficult. But just because indigenous form of cartography in Tibet was, had a lot of complexities, this did not stop Chinese nation state and British to uh, like stop them from producing their maps of their own. Because in uh, 1701, the King Empire commissioned a scientific map with the help of a French Jesuit. In 1737, after a multi-volume book on China was sanctioned and published in Paris, a pirated edition of the maps from the expedition created uh, was published as an atlas. And this atlas remained the authoritative source for locating Chinese and Tibetan boundaries. Until 1857, when the British started ma mapping Tibet. And this 1857, is also significant for other reasons in Indian history, but it's one more reason it is significant is because uh, that indigenous Tibetan form of mapping in encountered colonial form of mapping because uh, Major William had, uh, Edmund Hay uh, sanctioned the creation of the Wise Collection, a series of panoramic maps produced by a traveling lama who incorporated 
Western understanding of geographic indicators, as well as religious cart uh, indigenous cartography of Tibet. Now, guided by the anxiety over peripheries and broader European desire of uh, enlightenment as a tool to conquer, the Britishers started attempting to map Tibet using the panoramic maps that I spoke about in the late 19th and the early 20th century. With the annexation of Darjeeling from Sikkim in 1835, the British were ex interested in extending the reach to the peripheries of the Himalayan borderlands. This led to them choosing Darjeeling due to its geographical proximity and historical ties with Tibet as the site to invest in for knowledge production of Tibet maps and Tibet language dictionaries. As Tibets had significant barriers to entry, uh, a proxy Tibet was propped up in Darjeeling. For example, while living in Darjeeling, Thomas Austin Waddell, a sanitary officer, engaged in scholarship around the religious order of the Lamas. A school for espionage was set up in Darjeeling by the Britishers, led by Sarat Chandra Das, to engage in, uh, in espionage across Tibet and co contact Lama, uh, the top Lamaist hierarchies uh, in Tibet. And this was eventually published as a book titled Journey to Lhasa and Central Tibet by Sarat Chandra Das. And when once post-1904 Young Husband Expedition, which was coercive and militant in nature, which led to the signing of the Convention of Lhasa, which accepted the suzerainty of China over Tibet, when the barrier, the access to Tibet was closed off, they, they started sanctioning Tibetan dictionaries in Darjeeling, the Britishers. In 1904, the Char Charles Bell published Tibetan Glossary. 1909, Tashi Wangden Wangdi published the Tibetan English Hindi Guide. The Ghum, ministry, the Ghum Monastery in Darjeeling served as a key site that for this sort of collaboration, blurring academic pursuit and imperialist desires. And this is why I, when I talk about cartography practices, I'm also associating it with the other knowledge production methodologies that are involved. Uh, in this con uh, if the British uh, Empire's cartographic um, uh, attempts ended with the independence of India in 1947, Chinese cartographic manipulation and Tibetan resistance are visible even today. Post the 1950 invasion of China, and 1959 Chinese crackdown that led to the migration of refugees and His Holiness Dalai Lama to sites like Darjeeling. Uh, they, Chinese also uh, created the, the Tibetan Autonomous Region, consisting only of the Yutsang province and a small area of Kham, uh, very limited compared to the larger area where ethnic Tibetans have always resided. And uh, in this context, however, the Tibetan government in Lhasa in 1913 also had engaged in cartographic resistance. During the Simla conference, for example, there was a negotiated map that was drawn up, but the Chinese eventually refused it. Uh, in the 1917, 1981, 1983, uh, the, the three eras, the information office of the Tibetan government in exile published significant other maps. But one question that this poses is that a lot of these maps did not have, uh, it's, I'm not saying it to, in totality, but a lot of these maps had accepted the Western understanding of map making. So the question it poses is also, does the Western cartographic imagi imagination hold so much power that even resistance to it accepts its internal logic? And if in this case, the Britishers had succeeded in kind of uh, forcing the resistance to co-op the Western logic, in one case that they, they could not succeed, is the containment of Tibet and Tibetan culture within the boundaries that they had fixed. And this is where my arguments, uh, the, the argument that I'm making, is that the colonial creation of a hill town like Darjeeling, resembling Tibetan life and culture, possibly allowed for the Tibetans post-migration from China to choose Darjeeling as a site to arrive at, due to not just the geographical similarities and historical ties, but also the socio-cultural proximity that came out of colonial and imperialist desires. And so four waves of migration from Tibet happened to Darjeeling after the 1950 invasion. And the initial refugees had to navigate a lot of ethnic dynamics, especially with the ne Nepali population of Darjeeling, and the older Tibetan origin population of uh, Bhutias. And this led to the intricate display of Tibetan identity, creating a classification of pre-exile and post-exile Tibetans. The Bhutias had started migrating to Darjeeling in the 6th century. Their migration increased in the 17th and 18th century. And their presence in the landscape of Darjeeling as natives created a space where the newer Tibetans could find refuge and build socio-cultural capital. The Bhutia identity itself became a route for the Tibetans to claim nativity for the purposes of ac accessing Indian citizenship, ration cards, and even scheduled tribe status to claim government jobs in, and education. The, uh, according to Tibet, uh, T.B. Subba, the anthropologist T.B. Subba, post-exile Tibetans engaged in business and trade, including handicrafts, garments, and poultry, and food industry, etc. They built self-help centers, and the Bhutias often supported the centers to create products not just for trade, but also to create, uh, sell, uh, to 
is send globally images of the Dalai Lama and, and Potala Palace. And if this economic adaptation was successful, the social adaptation depended highly on the uh, internal cohesion of the newer Tibetans, at the same time religion. And this religion that the, socio, the religious capital that the newer Tibetans could build was based on the religious landscape that the older Tibetan migrants, the colonial uh, relationships had already built. For example, before even the newer Tibetans entered Darjeeling, there were 2,500 monasteries, including the Yoga Chogli Monastery in Ghom being the most prominent. And this religious can landscape was eventually used to build newer monasteries like Sonada and Dali, not, not only as prayer halls, but as centers for spreading Tibetan Buddhism across the globe and generating a unified Tibetan identity centered around the socio-religious identity. Now, of course, there has been significant conflicts. It's not like there haven't been conflicts. For example, the local uh, Bhutias often um, talk about how the newer Tibetans have gotten more jobs using the ST quota, or uh, they, according to Sudhi Basu, they speak to the newer Tibetans in Nepali, asserting the fact that they have nativized and the newer Tibetans have not. And the Nepalis themselves have a deep suspicion of Tibetans because of the neutrality they maintain uh, during the Gorkhalan movement and protests. And so what we observe, just, I'm just concluding, uh, one more conclusion. <laughs> what we observe is the Darjeeling social, cultural, and economic landscape today has been significantly shaped by the migration of Tibetans since the 1950s. While accepting their belongingness in Tibet and at the same time assimilating Tibet, Tibetans have also managed to turn Darjeeling into a key site for them to generate social, cultural, and financial capital that along with networks of monasteries has allowed them to engage in portraying their Chinese identity in the, uh, the distinct identity in the global space and use it for garnering uh, solidarity for the resistance to the Chinese occupation. In a region with a dynamic social geography and pre-existing historical connectivity, Cartographic tension generated by British cartographic practices, Chinese attempts at cartographic manipulation have thus modified and intensified the roots of connection between Tibet and Darjeeling. Now, just one more line. Uh, <laughs> just two more questions that I want to pose from this analysis that I've not touched upon, can be touched upon, is the question of resistance and how often resistance co-ops the logic of the hegemonic or hegemonic or uh, the, the power center. And the second question is by this, uh, by dislocating the conversation of Tibetans in India from Dharamshala to Darjeeling, the question that I'm trying to pose is, usually they ask what happens to migrants, how they adapt to in an unfamiliar place. The question I'm asking is, what happens when my migrants migrate to a place that is familiar to them? Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> I must, <clears throat> sorry. I must say, uh, very interesting, in fact, uh, very much related to myself and many of the audience over here, uh, to know, you know, the basically the time span was uh, very nicely taken over from right before uh, the coming of the British, the kind of dynamism that pre prevailed in Darjeeling and how after the, the, uh, the mapping and how basically the um, knowledge production to be very specific, you know, environment changed and further post-1950, further how the dynamics over the Darjeeling has changed. So basically a nice uh, shifting landscape that has been experienced in Darjeeling has been presented by uh, Abhinav. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> second, uh, third uh, presenter we have is uh, Sonam Chodak, uh, Chodak Bhutia. Um, he is a PhD scholar from uh, Department of History, Sikkim University. Uh, his uh, topic is also, again, in the same region and focusing more on this uh, Sikkim and more specifically on the community called Drogpa. I'm sure many of you, um, um, everybody must be knowing. So basically, he's interested in the ch changing uh, dyna uh, dynamism of social, political, and economic history in Sikkim, Tibet, following Chinese in invasion, so post 1950s. The, that is the area that he is very much uh, interested in his research. But uh, for today's presentation, the topic is trade relation uh, between Sikkim and Tibet, with special reference to Dropa of North Sikkim in India. Um, Sonam, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. Uh, thank you, sir, for saying a few words about my own background. So my topic for today's presentation is a trade relation between Sikkim and Tibet, with special reference to drug pass of northern Sikkim, India. So my talk is particularly relevant to those of you 
who wanted to know more about the northern border communities of Sikkim, more particular about Drukpas of northern Sikkim. For this uh, current uh, conference, my research paper has been broadly subdivided into eight broad headings, which are as follows. Uh, introduction, historical background of Sikkim and Tibet, trade and geographic features between Sikkim and Tibet, historical conduct of trade between Sikkim and Tibet, the northern traders of Sikkim, issues and challenges, impact of political change and conclusions. To begin with introduction, in introductory part, I'm mainly concerned about opening the hidden land of Bayul Demazon, which was once blessed by Guru Rinpoche, and Sikkim deep spiritual and cultural connection with Tibet. I've also worked on the role of Tibetan government called Gendeng Fodrang and its ties with uh, Namgal dynasty of Sikkim and large Sikkim estate in Tibet. And this chapter also talks about the Namgal rulers, a strong matrimonial alliance with Tibet. The several Sikkimese queens came from Tashi Lumpo, the monastic seat of Panchen Lama. Sikkim had maintained the cordial relation with Tashi Lumpo and the Gendeng Fodrang from 1642 till 1959. So this interactive part of chapter goes on till the entry of British in Sikkim that upon the arrival of British in Sikkim that destroyed the Sikkim close contact with Tibet. Further, Sikkim support towards British India Young Hospital expedition Tibet in 1904 strained the prevailing historical relationship between Sikkim with Tibet. So I'm not going to uh, talk uh, details about the soft headings. I, I will only pick the, some of the important points that, are, that I'm, I'm going to speak about. So in the next soft headings about historical background about Sikkim and Tibet. So in this uh, soft heading, I have mainly focused upon Sikkim historical relationship with Tibet right from 1640s till 1975. Here I talk about various political events in course of Sikkimese history, the beat from Anglo-Nepal War of 1814-16s and 1870 Treaty of Sigauli till 1861 Treaty of Tumblong that exert the British influence over Sikkim, overtaking the Tibetan traditional influence over Sikkim and how the advent of British over Sikkim made Tibet a targeting point for British to exert the political and economic influence. So uh, my next soft heading is about trade and its geographical features between Sikkim and Tibet. So if you look into the map of Sikkim, uh, so uh, Sikkim and Tibet, so it's basically it's a landlocked country. It is only accessible through land routes by lofty mountain pass and peaks. So because of Tibet being uh, immediate neighbors who, and close culture connection with Sikkim, Sikkim uh, traded trade only with Tibet. So Drogpas, one of the ancient pastoral communities who originally belonged to neighboring Tibet and China and found widely scattered across the Himalayan state of Sikkim, Bhutan, Nepal, Arunachal Pradesh, Himachal, Uttarakhand and Ladakh and Kashmir regions of India. So Drogpas so basically means the one who live in solitudes in extreme harsh geographical conditions that remain snowbound around the years. So they use these mountain paths and peaks for trans-Himalayan pastoral trade and other grazing opportunities across these Himalayan belts. So today, the Drogpas of Sikkim are, are of two main subgroups. The Drogpas of Sikkim, they are mainly of two main subgroups, mainly the Mugutang Drogpa subgroups and the Cholama and Cholamu Drogpa subgroups. The difference between this Mugutang Drogpa subgroup and Cholama, Cholamu Drogpa subgroups is they use different migrated routes. So as per the recent reports, the Mugutang Drogpa subgroup hold only 12 household. Similarly, the Cholama Drogpa also subgroup also holds only 12, sub, 12 household. So if you look into the historical conduct of trade, between Sikkim and Tibet, this the initial trade conducted between Sikkim and Tibet was mainly a traditional base of trade based on barter systems. The pilgrimage from both side also uh, both sides also brought goods and commodities for exchange along these routes. Besides Drogpas of Sikkim, another northern border communities of Sikkim, such as Lachin Pass and Lachung Pass, were also involved in these trade activities. So. Uh, after Sikkim came under British occupations, so any dispute with regards to trade business were looked upon by the British political officers. The one such case of 1921 related with trade disputes between the Kampa Zongs and the Lachin and Lachung peoples were also looked upon by the British political agents. The Kampa Zongs, one of the major mountain paths in North Sikkim, were used by Drogpas, Lachins, and Lachung peoples for movements for pastorals and trade conducts. So due to Drogpas, the Lachins and Lachung influence over this mountain pass Pass, the Zongpens of Kampazong also issued tax on the sheep and yaks grazing from, from the people of Lachin and Lachung. Historically, in olden days, there was an order that allowed free grazing grounds for sheep and yaks belonging to Sikkimese. 
The old order also read out that the land was taken for cultivations by Lachin Lachin people in Kampachans and in Kongmar district of Tashi Lumpu. So, but after this order was violated by Kampachans, the matter was also transferred by Sikkim to both British police officers and TV authorities to resolve the disputes. In 1868, one, uh, one of the archival records stated that about an agreement between Sikkim and Tibet that completely withdraw the imposition of taxes for grazing rights for the people of Lachin and Lachung peoples. So further, the 1868 regulations were superseded by the 1893 agreements that allowed the mutual grazing rights applied to both Tibetans and Sikkim to use these mountain paths to cross over in both territories for grazing and other trade opportunities. Besides these northern rules, the major parts of Sikkim's TV trade was conducted in the eastern part of Sikkim, so mainly by the Nathola and Jervla being two major routes in eastern Sikkim. Even in the major flow of trade activities are conducted by Sikkim through the Nathola and Jelabra. The Jelabra alone carried 62% of India TV trade, so while the Nathola carried 38% of total goods traded between India and Tibet. So in the major export to Tibet includes cotton, Peas, goods, dyes, gold, iron, salt, sugar, tea, metals, tobacco, heightened skins, etc. So import from Tibet mainly include wool, yak tails, woolen clothes, woolen yam, woolen carpet, foodstuffs, and livestock. So my next wedding is about northern traders of Sikkim. So before the opening of Jelabla and Nathola, with the Accord of, of Sino-British Convention of 1893, the main trade activities between Sikkim and Tibet was mostly conducted in the northern district of Sikkim. The, this Jalebla and Nathola later on became the uh, major center of British India trade center. Both this mountain pass of Jalebla and Nathala are situated along the Chola range of eastern se sector of Sikkim. The royal family of Sikkim also used this Chola mountain pass to enter Tibet to reach towards the Chumbi Valley, the Sikkim summer palace of royal family. The mountain pass of Nathola and Jalabla were used by both yak herders from Tibet and Sikkim for grazing and other trade activities. However, the real trade between Sikkim and Tibet was in operations at the northern border district of Sikkim. In North Sikkim, the trade was mostly, mostly conducted through the mountain pass of Kongrala, Choten Himala, Donkia Pass, Nakula, Patala, Dasala, Sesala, and some other mountain passes. All these mountain passes of North Sikkim are divided into three different directions. As per my recent research, I have divided this into three different sectors in northern district of Sikkim, like eastern, western, and northern zones. So these were the different uh, mountain pass and peaks that are mostly used by these uh, northern border communities of Sikkim and Drog Pass. For instance, in the eastern part of northern Sikkim lies the mountain pass such as Patala and Sesala. In the western zone lies mountain pass such as Soten Niemala and in northern zone and in northern zone lies mountain pass such as Kongrala, Nakula, and Dachila. So these were important mountain pass used by drug pass and Lachin Lachung peoples to enter Tibet for trade and other grazing opportunities. Trade from these passes reached towards Tibet major towns of Shigache and Lhasa. Along these mountain pass, the Sikkim exports to Tibet mainly includes timber, fruit, spices, and the goods procured from British India. From Tibet, Sikkim major imports include salt, gold, precious stones, teas, wools, and carpets. Uh, some of the issues and challenges. The rising uh, environmental uh, problems have immensely affected these traditional communities like drug pass who live in these isolated mountain areas. The area inhabited by drug pass are losing its vegetation covers. The less snowfall cover in the regions and the reported daily monsoons and shorter winters are causing serious challenges to drug pass traditional way of living and uh, nomadic lifestyles. Besides environmental, the culture and religious values of Drogpas are also on birds of extinctions. Drogpas who worship mountains as the guardian deity are believed to be losing their powers due to melting of snow cap mountains. The surrounding holy mountains was now reduced to a few whims of white snow hair cover. Besides this uh, environmental, uh, culture, this culture and religions, the political also, political crisis after 1950s and the Chinese invasion of Tibet further disrupted Drogpa communities who depended upon traditional nomadic lifestyles along the borders of Sikkim and Tibet. All the traditional agreements signed between Sikkim and Tibet that mutually benefited for the migratory practice was disrupted. The border was closed and now the military presence along Drogpa's area are increasingly day by day. So impact of the political changes. So Drogpa's so who originally belongs to Tibet and live on nomadic lifestyles more subsequently affected after this Chinese invasion over Tibet and Sino in the war of 1962, which prohibited the trans-border movements for trade and other facilities. 
The sudden disclosure of border left some Drogba's family to settle inside Sikkim's and order to remain on Tibetan side of borders. The remaining in Sikkim, the Drogba's mainly settles in Mog, Tang, Tangu, Lhasa Valley, and its Cholambo areas. This shift in the geopolitical changes gradually affected the traditional nomadic communities of Sikkim. So this Drogba community of Sikkim, their social, economic, and cultural values were linked with number of animals they heard. But due to this growing challenge, be it for environmental or for political crisis, and with the loss of, of herding of animals, the, today the Drogba cultures were also on the burst of loss. They are now finding the other uh, available means of sustenance. The Chinese invasion over Tibet and Sino in the war of 1962, today all these mountain paths of North Sikkim had fallen into disuse for trade. The mountain paths, which were once used by Lachin and Lachung and Drogpas, are now not accessible for them to enter. The traditional grazing grounds they were now torn into military zones. Mountain paths such as Kongrala in North Sikkim have flared off as contested zone between India and China. All the traditional mountain paths of, of North Sikkim, which were once used by Drogpas and Northern traders of Sikkim to enter Tibet, if left upon, have a tremendous potential to uplift the economic states. Unlike Nathola in East Sikkim, North Sikkim also has potential trade points which was once used by drug pass to, op uh, to use by drug pass to enter tribute as well. So basically what uh, my research finding about uh, this uh, paper is that uh, ancient, like ancient Sikkim and Tibet, we have like traditional uh, culture and religious close connections. So this uh, drug pass basically, as, as sorry, as only mentioned, we have an open border before the intervention of British. So these communities used to move here and there, but after, after 1950s, there was shift in the geopolitical changes. Their traditional migratory practice was totally disrupted. And even after further that 1962 Sino war, that led to uh, like standstills. In the, like they prohibited the, they, the border was completely sealed. So because of that, you know. So before that, what I was mentioning that some of the important mountain passes in North Sikkim, for instance, like I mentioned about Nakula, Sesela, Kongra. I think many of the audience from here they have never heard about these passes. These passes were very very important pass because people used to move freely from there. Even trade was conducted between the northern border communities of Sikkim and with Tibet. People like even the Kampajans, the governor of this Jongpans, for him it was very difficult to maintain, you know, to conduct the, the, these these things because activity trade was it is very high space. But what I want to say is that unlike this Nathola, because Nathola is today like is like there is the heavy trade, trade activities was conducted between Sikkim and Tibet. Trade was tremendous happening. It is but similarly that the northern border district of Sikkim also has a potential if open. So what my research finding is that well, this, some of these passes, like Kongrala, this is one of the contested uh, border, uh, border point of, of India uh, currently. So it is highly contested zone. But also, if, if you open the re engage into dialogue uh, with, uh, with, with the partners, I think if, if opens that the northern district of Sikkim also has the huge potentials uh, to uplift the economic uh, scenario of the state also and for the nation also. And I believe that, uh, I think that uh, time has come to re-engage uh, in dialogue to potentially open uh, these important trade points in Northern Sikkim, which was once used by these traditional communities. Because uh, as of now, this Northern Sikkim is completely sealed. So uh, wherever this mountain pass today is totally highly militarized zone. So there is heavy consideration of armed forces. But in the same way also, if open for these trade activities, I think this will be a new economic corridor. Uh, that, that will highly uh, benefits uh, to the Sikkim. I, what, what, what I believe, and North Sikkim being also the largest district of Sikkim, uh, I think uh, has the potential uh, and and what is expectation of converting uh, Sikkim into a global new uh, economic uh, trade markets. So uh, this is what uh, uh, my uh, this cotton paper uh, mainly deal about that. So. So I, I, I wrap up my presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Namna, and also for finishing on time, way on time. Um, to put it uh, in sh shortly from what I understand, uh, he's given a very nice presentation about uh, how mm, the trade relationship between Tibet and uh, Sikkim, which was existing many uh, centuries uh, at the, from the right from the time of the barter system has over a period of time uh, either changed because of the uh, presence of colonial uh, such as British 
or China. And also because of uh, the modern challenges such as the environment challenges and the uh, political dynamics that has taken place has basically uh, imposed a huge amount of challenges on the livelihood of the Dopas. And I, do, I wonder, uh, you know, through his presentation, you know, how they may be surviving these days or what kind of support have been provided um, by the uh, state or the central and um, and are their voice being heard or, or are they, do they have any power as to what is to happen in the border region. Thank you. Thank you, Sonamla. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, with this... Uh,